Welcome to Explorers, a podcast of Reflections Ministries featuring Dr. Kenneth Boa and Stuart McAllister. Here, Ken and Stuart draw on the wisdom of their years to explore how we love, learn, and listen well. Hi, welcome to Explorers. I'm Cameron McAllister. Ken Boa with you as well, and I'm looking forward to our chat today, my friend. Yeah, likewise, Ken. So today we're going to talk, as we often do, Ken, when you and I talk, we're going to talk movies. But specifically, I wanted to talk about Terrence Malick. Now, he's a name, it depends on who who you're talking to or what circles you're you're in. For some people, this this is a big name. He's one of the most celebrated directors, I think, alive today. Others might not know the name. He might be a bit obscure. So I'll name a couple of his films here real quickly just to give the listeners a reference point. I do think that both both of us would actually heartily recommend Terrence Malick. He's a very profound and profoundly Christian filmmaker. That doesn't mean he isn't challenging at times. But so with that qualification in mind, I think most people would probably know Terrence Malick today because of the movie Tree of Life which I think you could argue is probably one of his best films. But some of his other movies would include The Thin Red Line. That one's my personal favorite, by the way. Also, Badlands, Days of Heaven, The New World, and, of course, recently, A Hidden Life. So he's an absolutely fascinating person. I'll bring in some biographical details here in a little bit. But on the note of biography... Ken, I was just wondering, you've got an extensive history with with movies and, and cinema. How did you first encounter Terrence Malick? Well, Karen and I saw his his uh, first, well, his second film. Uh, he did Badlands before that, which I hadn't seen. So the first time we encountered him way back <clears throat> in 1978. Right. Way back then, Days of Heaven. And uh, we were just uh, amazed by that film because there were so many par- powerful components in it that uh, Richard Gere was in it and Brooke Adams and Sam Shepard. It was a remarkable film, though, in many respects uh, that captured us. In fact, Karen and I just revisited uh, Days of Heaven. Yeah. Uh, um, we hadn't seen it in th- that many years. And so, right? it, but it, it's, it, it was something about the cinematic qualities and his voiceovers as well that the, the character voiceover so that there's the whole dimension of the development of the interior life with exquisite beauty and and he forces you like Andrei Tarkovsky to actually take a look more closely at the natural world so that it, both directors I think he was very much influenced by Tarkovsky's films but I think that at the same time you see the use of the natural the cinematography the graphics the, the all those components were very rich and, 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 and beautifully embedded in the texture of the film. And just to linger on the point for a second about narration, that'll sound a little odd, I think, to some of us, because you think, well, okay, a film with a narrator, what's so special about that? It's giving you some exposition, telling you about the plot. It doesn't actually work like that in a Terrence Malick film. The only way to put it is what you're getting with Ter- with narration in Terrence Malick's movies is a glimpse into the inner life of the character. And that is remarkably difficult to do. The dialogue first of all, it has to sound it has to sound natural and human and it it, ha- it doesn't in other words it shouldn't sound like the actor is just reading about plot developments. And Terrence Malick actually did this from the very start. So his movie, Badlands. So by the way, I mentioned he can be a challenging director. Badlands is a challenging movie. It's done very tastefully and carefully, but this is about two people on a killing spree, two teenagers on a killing spree. And so naturally that's, that's very difficult subject matter, but Sissy Spacek plays it's, so it's, it's Martin Sheen and Sissy Spacek, both very young in this film. Very much. Yeah. 1973. That's right. And so Sissy Spacek's narration of the film is really unsettling because she has this very chirpy, childlike kind of voice, and there's this odd naivete and innocence about it, and yet they're killing people. And so you you feel this very odd tension in the film. But now fast forward to a movie like Tree of Life. 
which is wrestling with some of the major issues of, of human life, evil and suffering, loss, the loss of a child. When you hear the narration in that film, this is a soul in, in just pouring its heart out to God. And the fact that he was able to, to capture this in, in a film, and by the way, the, 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 narr the narration interweaves just beautifully with the absolutely stun stunning imagery. And the only way for you to really understand this is to sit down and watch a Terrence Malick film. These are just absolutely, they're visual feasts. I mean, Days of Heaven is such a breathtaking movie, even just, just to watch. And again, it's a film with amazing narration. There's a, I, I'm the, Linda Mance, I think, is the is the child actor who who narrates the film, and she has I this, think that's right. Yeah, yes. this kind of raspy voice that strange is strange voice. Yes, it's but very it, strange. It, it, it's ideal because there's something uh, odd about that. There's something that's um, almost um, alien, a disconnection, as it were. And so that that voice and just her simple way of describing the events it was was actually. Um, kind of um, alarming in some ways, but appealing in another. It was a very clever use. And then his third, his use of music. So it's not only the, the voiceover and the imagery that he, this astonishing, uh, breathtaking sometimes imagery, but then the music that he, the way he piles it in. So he's layering the sensorium, layering the, the, the sense of uh, capture and the, the multiplying the experience by those, uh, those dynamics. It's worth talking about Terrence Malick, the man, and it's going to be kind of hard to talk about him because he's he's kind of an evasive person. Now, I've I have mentioned this before on other podcasts, but I have a little bit of a problem with people calling you know artists reclusive when they shy away from the spotlight because it's not necessarily the case that they're reclusive. It just may be the case that they don't want to be celebrities and they find that to be a distraction or if they, they just want to have a private life. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, over you people like J.D. Salinger come to mind, author of Franny and Zoe, Catcher in the Rye most famously. He was, you know, he was quite, he, he wasn't known to give many interviews. He was called reclusive. In our own day, Thomas Pynchon or Pinchon, very, very few interviews given by the man. This is the author of Gravity's Rainbow, Crying of Lot 49. All the all the stuff that's inflicted on you in grad school programs, but he, I mean, again, he's. I don't think he's necessarily reclusive. Well, Terrence Malick is like that too. He doesn't grant interviews, and so what was interesting about him though is he he bursts onto the cinematic scene with Badlands, which was very well received. I mean, clearly, it, it's very rare that you get a filmmaker who makes a debut that is a mature debut. And that was a mature work. Yes, it, it was. It was as though he had been preparing for it his entire life. And then he delivers Days of Heaven, which was the first that you saw. And then he just disappears for a long time. 20 years. 20 years. He, you know, he, he had studied philosophy at Harvard. He, I believe in this interval, he went to France for a while. And who knows what he was doing? I mean refining his vision, listening to exquisite music by the time. I mean, he, he's, a, he's an amazing, as you mentioned, Ken, he's an amazing curator of, of great stuff. And by the way, in many ways, I think a case could be made that this, that Terrence Malick is a uniquely Ken Boa kind of director <laughs> and especially Tree of Life, his movie, because Ken, your whole con conception of the microcosm, the midicosm and the macrocosm, that film basically features all three indeed because yeah. you I mean you have this family in in Waco Texas I believe it is and it's it's this little this little family you know the dad's a frustrated I think architect and the mom is is dealing with the loss of a child but then you have this cosmic vision where you see the created order unfolding there's a sequence in that film that's about 20 minutes long with again amazing music but this is just to to prepare you, some viewers, when I mean, if you go in expecting a kind of traditional film, this scene is a frustration to many people because it's it's long. You think, why am I why am I seeing creation unfolding? But of course, the movie begins with a quotation from the Book of Job, "Where were you?" And that sort of acts as a symbolic kind of guide for for the way the whole film unfolds at that point, but. Just a few biographical details to, to show you that this is a this is a highly unusual 
guy, a very interesting thinker with, with some very powerful things to say. But what we can, I think, lean into here, Ken, as we talk about him more is I mentioned earlier that he's a profoundly Christian filmmaker. And maybe we should tease out a little bit of why that is the case. Yes, in fact, he embeds this uh, whole narration in the creation epic, and even his new his newer film, which is uh, has come out uh, about this whole area of. Um, let's see if I can find it for us here. Um, the um, this as as a director, though his um, his work on um, the um, voyage of time. It, that came out in 2016. I was looking for that, and 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 a life's journey is is way of describing. So that's a kind of a whole immersion into the creation and then the development. So there's a whole movement through the ethos of how we got where we are and how we became where we are. But then in this, what he does in this film, in the um, Tree of Life, is that he is contextualizing their little life in the light of that larger life. And so there's a kind of a macrocosm, microcosm, in, in a sense. Their whole lives, their whole drama, their whole narrative is just this a teen, teeny little component um, in, a, in a distant uh, component of the world. It's just remote. And what tethers it together? What gives it meaning? What gives substance to this transitory experience of, uh, of, of this journey and this life and how you have the tensioned interplay with Brad Pitt and Sean Penn and the conflicting teachings that are, that are arising as well and trying to struggle with the pain of, of birth, growth, decay, and death. So he, he's very big on the cycles of life as well, this whole idea of the tree of life and moving through that cycle of birth, growth, de decay, and death and, and seeing what does it mean. And so in my, in my view, he's contextualized that in a larger fr and framing in a larger narrative. That's where the Christian dimension, I think, comes in, where it's a framing and contextualizing of the apparent absurdities of this little life with something that's going to have a resolution, that there will be, things will be well. And there's a sense, in, even at the end of that film, where you have a kind of a fundamental resolution in a, in a nexus in space and time that's somehow connected to the larger whole. Yeah, and I think that's, that's really well said. And it's worth pointing out also that the, the narration from Jessica Chastain's character in this movie uniquely is more of prayer i would say it's almost this is clearly her character talking to she's god she's speaking to god and yeah yep. yes he's some are wrestling with god uh, yep. but but she speaks to god and she does wrestle with god in her in her, in her questions but there is much more of a of a, d a dimension of of believing rather than de than denying and it, in spite of the absurdities of life there is that that whole quest there's that 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 idea well it's dynamic because it's she this is an actual relationship yes. with the living god and yes. as we walk through life and we deal we deal with unbelievable pain and searing loss also beautiful and wonderful things all of those elicit responses from us it's not unlike the the book of psalms of course Again, to think about what she's what what Terence Malick is doing here is it's closer to a Shakespearean monologue again, yeah. than it is to a traditional narration track, and the cadences of the voice and all all of that bear that out. But part of so for me, so Tree of Life was my introduction to Terence Malick, and part of what blew me away about the film, and then, so I watched Tree of Life, and then. I immediately, it was one of those moments of revelation where I have to go watch everything this man has ever done. And, you know, fair warning, not every, you know, in my view and Ken's he's view. He's uneven. He's uneven. And, you know, again, he's a bold director and he takes risks and sometimes it doesn't work. And that's, that's all right. So not all of, not all of his films are necessarily going to be as powerful, but What's what's incredible about Tree of Life is I don't know that I've ever seen a film quite as evocative as Tree of Life, something that is able to just pull you into a child a childhood state of mind almost instantly when you're following these two boys in their childhood adventures, whether it's <laughs> chasing after that truck, releasing the what was that insect spray, the DDT, yeah, they, yeah, yeah, and running through the, through the fog as though it's some sort of magical, and of course we know <laughs> it's extremely harmful <laughs> now. So good. Yeah, or when they're you know when they're having fun, they're seeing fireworks, or when they're hurting an animal, 
that seems to be an, a, a sort of perverse rite of passage for a lot of human beings in their childhood years, you know, bringing harm to some helpless creature. Malik has included all of that in this film, which which is part of what makes it so cosmic in scope and goes all the way down to the, the most minute details and then comes all the way out into the just the vast cosmic scheme. So it's a very grandiose picture and one I think that just captures the restlessness of the human heart and the actual dynamism of of our wrestlings with God. It's just, it's very, very rare to be able to get that kind of vision in a movie. I mean, let's face it, movies are usually what we watch to kick back and have fun. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. But obviously this is not that kind of movie and this is not that kind of direction. Yeah, you're, you're right. No, it's, and it's, again, Voyage of Time is like an amplification of that larger scene that's found in Tree of Life. And so it, it's the contextualization in the creation narrative. The, 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 whole idea, that, the whole dynamic of him seeing the whole narrative of creation and then fall, and then we have redemption, and then the new creation. And even, all four are really f found in varying ways mm -hmm. um, in, all, in, in the, both the Tree of Life and some of his other films as well. But uh, this whole idea of, of the beginning of a thing and then how it has its inevitable demise and yet there's a redemptive dimension so it seems to me that malik is trying to contextualize the pains and sorrows and uncertainties of the human condition into a larger narrative that is broader bigger and greater than we could have ever imagined and it's it's really in my mind a theistic narrative we're so glad you've discovered the explorers podcast We'd like to take this opportunity to remind you that Reflections Ministries is supported by generous friends like you. If you'd like to make a donation, head to our website at www.reflections.org and click the donate button at the top right-hand corner of the screen. Now, back to Dr. Boa and Stuart McAllister. And it's no accident, I think, that he is interested in, quote, nobodies. And of course... <laughs> There are no nobodies in the Christian view, but he's interested in people who are not necessarily big superstars or he's not interested in superheroes. One of his most recent films, probably one of his most conventional in recent years, is A Hidden Life about the man, I mean, a man who resisted the Nazis. There's just it's worth pointing out Terrence Malick would not have made a movie about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, not because there's anything wrong with Bonhoeffer, but because Bonhoeffer is a celebrity and Malik is very interested in hidden lives. He's very interested in those seemingly small people who are actually, in truth, not small at all. It's, it's a kind of, I don't know, diary of a country priest sort of approach to, to looking at heroes of the faith. Yes, he's taking, he's taking something that is actually, as in diary of a country priest, an unknown, this person who is seems to be um, marginalized, but he, again, he contextualizes that pain, that angst, that that suffering that he goes through. But there's a redemptive. Once again, there's a redemptive dimension that's bigger than that. Um, going back to middle to, to this whole idea of a hidden life, um, I haven't read this, but I'm certain that's where he got it from. Was the end of Middlemarch? Um, Dorothy uh, Brooke, the protagonist of uh, George Eliot's uh, Middlemarch, and. Here's how it ends. The effect of her being on those around her was incalculably diffusive. And you know I love those two words. Because you can't quantify your impact on another human's life. It has a ripple effect. And it's a beautiful picture because he's saying in spite of the fact that she didn't achieve her full potential because of a lot, all, a lot of these uh, manipulators in her life that diminished her potential in some, some ways, nevertheless there's a larger whole. Uh, that he says that things are not as ill with you and me as they might have been is half owing to a, uh, a number, the number who lived faithfully a hidden life and rest in unvisited tombs. That beautiful image, lives faithfully hidden. And, and of course, in Malik's film, what you have here is a hidden life that was not known until only quite recently and revealed in a, in a, in a different way. So it was a very powerful big picture. I think it's a stark challenge to us in the North American church as well. Because, and this is why I think Terrence Malik's some of his recent films are helpful to us in our moment. I'm even thinking about one of his later ones. This was, I think, the one that followed Tree of Life, To the Wonder, which, as you know, Ken, is not my favorite of 
Malick's films. I don't think it quite works, but there are still some very compelling elements in it. And the priest in this movie is part of what makes the film worthwhile to me, portrayed by Javier Bardem. And he, he is very much living a kind of, he, he is very much a hidden life kind of character and doing wonderful, powerful work that is on many days feels insignificant and thankless. But I think in North America, we have, especially in the evangelical fold, we've, we've thought of influence in very positive terms, which makes sense. We've wanted to make, we've wanted to be a positive influence on the culture and we've wanted to, to wield influence for the sake of the gospel. But we're finding ourselves now in a moment where the kind of influence that was so prized seems to be part of the past. Because Christianity in, in North America is is more and more... It's I think there's, there's less sympathy with it. Uh -huh. And there are a number of different factors that are contributing to that. But essentially, I mean, America has been for a long time becoming more and more post-Christian. And that just, I think we've seen real social acceleration on that point now. Yes. So in a moment where, where we find ourselves, Christians find themselves more marginalized, we need to ask ourselves and we need to pray this before our Lord, what does it mean to be faithful today with what we have? And how do we lean into what you have for us now I think many of us, we need to be willing and open to leading, quote, hidden lives that don't have the, necessarily the massive cultural influence that we that we had in mind, but that are nevertheless faithful and will exercise a tremendous, powerful impact. But that impact is measured more in terms of depth rather than sheer reach of numbers. Yes. A uh, uh, Franz Jagerstatter, we didn't even know about this man, and he brings him into beer. And so in Bavaria, he, su he suffers uh, for his convictions and ultimately then loses everything. And he does, he lived faithfully again, a hidden life, and, and for until recently rested in unvisited tombs. So sometimes, like chariots of fire, the same kind of a thing happens there with Eric Little, where he's honored uh, af posthumously more fully than he was uh, when he was alive. Are those little hints, though, of home? That is to say, there are no little people, no little places, no little events. And as a consequence, everyone matters. Yet, on one level, it, none of us matter from the standpoint of the, the, uh, the cosmic scope. It would seem with the vast con nature of this cosmos, and that's what he's de developing uh, in uh, this, uh, this whole uh, picture <laughs> of the, um, this, this beautiful... Uh, film series on the voyage of time. What is, it's so awesome, but what do we do? We matter. Yet he's arguing that because of the redemptive work of the living God who has invaded history, that there is a meaning, there is a purpose. There, it's not absurd, and that our 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 work is not going to be in vain if if it's done as unto the Lord. So, but who's our audience, and who to to what audience did we play? So it's a hidden audience. Uh, an audience of one, mm -hmm. rather, and I think that's one of the reasons. I think that Malik himself is a, an example of a man who's not trying to draw, draw attention to himself, but to the uh, to the craft, to the understanding that it's not me. I'm a mediator of a va vaster, great greatness, a good that transcends your imagination. And so there is a hope there. But I struggle with some of his later films because I felt that uh, things like Song to Song and. Uh, also, uh, Night of Cups into the One, it didn't quite do it for me. Though I, another film that I absolutely love, though, The Thin Red Line, because of the, and the music, my favorite, maybe it may be my favorite uh, musical score, Hans Zimmer's uh, Thin Red Line. Oh, wow. Uh, That's my favorite Malick film. Yes. Yeah. And, and the, just the, um, the music uh, to that, I listened to it a lot, just the, the score that uh, Zimmer did with that. That was my introduction to Hans Zimmer, in fact. So it's 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 he's a remarkably diverse uh, director. Um, Karen and I recently we also revisited his uh, his film, um, the um, the New World. That was fascinating to revisit that. And just again, there are certain malachisms. It's the, the the vast splendor, the beauty, the overall narrative, the historical nexus in which we find ourselves. And yet at the same time, it brings us down to the importance of a human being, even though not known, not seen, not uh, understood, yet there are certain quiet lives, hidden lives, 
of a scene. I think it's a motif in this film. You know, what's interesting, though, Ken, given what you said earlier about Malik, is that I think we're so conditioned now to think of directors as celebrities. And Malik is doing the opposite of that. I think of Keats's phrase, negative capability. He used that to describe Shakespeare, where Shakespeare, you're not going to find him in those characters because... Iago is every bit as the villains and Iago and all the bad guys are every bit as vivid and real as the heroes, as Hamlet, as, I mean, Shakespeare just sort of poured himself into everybody and receded behind the curtain, so to speak. And Malick does that with his films. And in, as an artist, he, he sort of, he's content to put it together, to work behind the scenes and sort of retreat so it's you're not going to see Terrence Malick showing up on, you know, a talk show or something and giving all of these in interviews. I think that would be contrary to his 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 philosophy of art as you, as you as it sort of unfolds from his work. And again, it's an interesting challenge to us because we tend to think of people like oh I don't know Quentin Tarantino and all of these who who do the talk show circuit who are extremely talkative in interviews and you know will rattle on about all their influences and all of that. And Malik doesn't want to draw a lot of attention to himself. And there's something very refreshing about that in, to, in today's environment. And there's, there seems to be something even kind of noble about that as well. And so that's, I think that's something worth celebrating, actually. I think he, I would totally concur that he is an incarnation of act, actually what he's trying to exhibit, namely that there, the Im impact that other people have can be incalculably diffusive. Again, this notion that our lives do matter, that there's a larger nexus and larger context, but we don't have to play to an audience of people. So it seems to me that he's trying to draw us away from that pop, that, that thin veneer of, of popularity and prestige and, and power and to bring us into the real issues of life where we all struggle with our agonies and our pains and so no one escapes the suffering and the adversity it's what we do with it and how we contextualize that adversity that I think that he provides an answer to that. But he himself, I think, in with, with that interior life is an exemplar of that very thing. He doesn't want to have the thinness of the circuit, but rather he wants to draw them into the interior quality of who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? What's life about? The, the fundamental questions of life that he, if you see his films with care, you begin to see every one of them raises those questions. So I think... To kind of summarize a little bit of what we've been talking about here, this is a film filmmaker worth your time. And part of what makes Terrence Malick, again, to use the phrase that I had earlier, profoundly Christian, is that he presents this world in which we live as God's good world, but he doesn't ignore the pain and suffering of a fallen creation and his extremely... Christian vision of human life. The people in Terrence Malick's films are made in the image of God, and they carry that beautiful significance, even when they're deeply flawed characters, and many of them are. Malick manages to represent the richness, the richness of the human experience in these films of human beings made by God and for God struggling in a fallen realm. That is part of what makes him a very prof a profoundly Christian filmmaker without ne necessarily fitting into... So he wouldn't be... I hope this distinction makes sense. He would not be marketed in, as a Christian filmmaker. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't find him necessarily on sale on a Christian streaming service or in a Christian bookstore because his, his, I think his films are too expansive to fit those categories. But when you look at his representation of human nature, the nature of reality, and our relationship with it, you'll find that this is a profoundly Christian vision. It's really essentially the concept of redemption of pain. And there's a motif that all of them go through it. There's a distorted good. And he understands this whole idea that evil is a parasite on good. It's a distorted uh, dis and dis disordered loves. And so he shows the drama of disordered loves in some of his films. And in others, he brings out that hope. And actually, there's a kind of a play of both kinds of characters. But both of them are still bearers of an imago that can be redeemed and, and, and it can be contextualized in a larger framed narrative that makes some sense. 
that otherwise would, in this island in which we find ourselves, would have no meaning at all. We would just find ourselves in a in a little com- component that's indescribably, incalculably tiny rather than diffusive. So he expands the narrative. What's tiny? Actually, the small things matter, and it will. And you're touching eternal beings, and therefore, it's not a question of the physicality, but actually the eternality of of the that image. So that one ripple effect affects another, but you can't quantify what that impact will be. Right, and I, there, that's why, broadly speaking, there are two <laughs> there are two very different ways to interpret that sense of smallness. Well, the one would be wonder, the other would be terror. C.S. Lewis was very good about talking about Zehnsucht and that sense of of longing and just just and it, that swells up in us when we feel just the immensity of life. I mean, C.S. Lewis in one of his most harrowing books, A Grief Observed, uses the phrase, all reality is iconoclastic, just shattering our idols and our expectations. And that can be sometimes a, a beautiful experience, sometimes terrifying. But the other way of looking at it, and this is the this is the view of a lot of, I would say, atheists or skeptics, this was Lovecraft's view, is that the immensity the sm- and our smallness equals terror. We are tiny, we are insignificant. The, the phrase for this is cosmic horror. Yes. But Malik is showing you that that immensity does not entail human insignificance at all, just the opposite. And so he does something that powerful artists have always done. You visit him and you feel less alone when you come out of the experience. You know, there's a difference between co- two kinds of terrors, and one is a holy terror, and the other, the other one is a meaningless horror. The idea of that that it's it's a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Or is there a, is it chance, or is it a dance? And so this idea that there's a dance going on, that in spite of the apparent absurdities, setbacks, and pains, he will redeem, and there's a bigger uh, overall vision of that understanding. In fact, with me as well, you know, I'm working with this museum of created beauty, and I want to create a sense of terror, but in the best sense, a holy awe, a wonder, a sense of uh, that Zainzucht again, something that draws me into a higher thing that I can't even begin to imagine. So you're both afraid of and yet drawn to. So there's a drawing. It's not one of revulsion, but rather a, a mysterious attraction, but you're uh, but you're drawn to him and o- overwhelmed by him at the same time. I think that is as powerful a recommendation <laughs> as the two of us can make for a director. We hope this has been interesting to you and helpful to you, and we hope maybe some of you will will check out the work of this very interesting filmmaker. It's certainly it certainly enriched my perspective, and. I think it, I think he can do the same for you. But thank you so much for listening. This is the Explorers Podcast, a podcast of Reflections Ministries. Thanks for listening to Explorers. If you'd like to learn more about what we do at Reflections Ministries, make a donation or book a speaker, please visit our website at reflections.org. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to the podcast and consider leaving a review. It makes a big difference.